Hey guys welcome back. This is the story about what if Naruto dated Rias in high school DxD. The author of this story is Blackplant, do check him out guys. Let's start. Hineko was discontent, even though she should have been happy. The looming disaster that had threatened her master and her by proxy was dealt with, had been for two days now. The situation was handled. Everything was fine. Yet Kaneko could not find it in herself to be properly happy about how things had gone. To explain the reason for her state of mind, one had to examine the story behind it. Kaneko was a devil. She had not been born one, in fact, she had been born a Nekashu, a rare and nearly extinct race of Nekamata. She had become a devil through a chess piece-like device known as an evil piece. The evil pieces allowed the high-class devil who owned them to reincarnate, sometimes even resurrect others into their peerage as their servants. Kaneko's master, Ria's Gremory, had reincarnated her and taken her into her household after she had lost everything. Yet Ria's herself had stood to lose a lot as well. She had been betrothed to Riser Phoenix, a man she abhorred for his view of her. That engagement had recently been challenged in a raiding game between the peerages. Kaneko had been taken out early on, and Ria's had lost the game. Only semi-legal intervention from Ria's older brother and Issei Hiyadu, a consummate pervert and fellow servant of Ria's, had managed to finally break the engagement. That last part was cause for celebration, but her own role in the ordeal soured Kaneko's mood. I need to get stronger. I'm the weakest in the peerage right now, she said to herself. It galled her to admit it, but it was true. Everyone else bar Ashia, who could not really be counted, had contributed more to the fight, and Issei, the second newest member of the peerage, who should have been the weak link, had accomplished what everyone else had failed to do. That was a wake-up call for her. She needed to improve if she did not want to be left behind. That thought accompanied her through the following days of doing contract work. Apart from training, fulfilling contracts for clients was the primary way for devils to get stronger. Well, for many, it was the only way to get stronger, since many devils, especially pure-blooded ones, were too lazy to train. Even Rhea's kind of fell into that category, all her training during the preparatory period before the raiding game had consisted of strategizing. That, more than anything, pointed out the importance of getting stronger. Kaneko only wished she could do so faster. Contracts were slow to do so, and training yielded inferior results without instructor. She had considered the idea of getting one several times now, but there were problems in the way of that. The first of them was that Rias did not have access to one suited for her combat specialty. Hiring a tutor from outside the wider Grimory household was also not viable, it required funds she did not have. Then there was the issue of whether one would even accept her. Her sister's actions had stained the reputation of the Nekamata in the underworld. If they learned that Kaneko was Kuroka's sister, they were likely to simply decline the contract. So, she was left at square one. Self-taught training and devil's contracts. At least she could devote herself to those contracts in peace. It was not exactly glamorous work, since she was most often just there to dress up in a costume and look cute. There was a surprisingly low rate of creeps among those who requested her for a contract. The few who wished to live out inappropriate fantasies involving her were either filtered out by Rias or beaten into a pulp by Kaneko herself. Devils were free to decline a contract, after all. Most of her customers were nice, however. Some people just wanted to vent with a cute girl to listen to them, others simply wanted to dote on her, and one time she had even been hired to serve as a model for the cover of a children's storybook. The deaths caused by Freed, a maniac who had murdered some of her customers, cast a shadow over the whole thing, but the man had disappeared after the battle at the abandoned church. Things were calm now. But therein lay the problem. Uneventful days meant no progress on the strengthening front. That was the sad reality of it. Sighing in resignation, she dedicated herself to her last contract of the day. She had chosen that contract to be the last for its laid-back nature. It was about taste-testing ramen, of all things, at a recently opened shop. As she was a consummate glutton, she had been given the request by Arias. It was not like Kaneko minded, however. She did like to eat, and having ramen sounded like a good way to end the workday. Soon after she had set foot on the teleportation circle, it activated. She arrived a moment later at her target destination. The room she found herself in looked clean but a bit barren, the only defining feature of it being a multitude of boxes and crates. It looked like she had been summoned into a storage area. It was not long before she spotted the figure of her summoner. He was a blonde man of average height. His build was lean but strong, and he wore a friendly smile on his face. Said face bore strange whisker-like marks on the cheeks. Was he some sort of yaokai? Are you the one who summoned me? She asked, for formality's sake. The man nodded enthusiastically. Yep. Name's Naruto Uzumaki. What's yours? Kaneko Taoju, she answered. If nothing else, he was courteous, even if his speech was very casual. Still, the previous question remained, so she asked. Are you a yakai? I've never seen a human with birthmarks like that. 
He laughed and replied. I get asked about those pretty often. My parents were human, if that's what you're asking, but there's something else in the family tree. Hineko nodded in acknowledgement before she moved on to the next topic. What's the specifics of the contract? You're all business, huh? He asked. I just take food seriously, she answered. He grinned and said. And I take ramen very seriously. You see, I've invested in this place. I want only the best ramen sold in any shop I have a stake in, and for that I need taste testers. I'm not complaining, but why did you hire a devil for that? Asked Kaneko. The answer is pretty easy, he said, your senses are sharper than a human's. You're better at tasting small nuances. When I said that I only wanted the best ramen served, I meant it. They then left the storage area and headed outside to the front of the shop. It was closed, even though the kitchen was running, so the two of them were alone. The kitchen staff was there too, but they seemed to not pay attention to them at all. The lack of customers meant that the two of them ate mostly in silence. That changed, however, when Kaneko looked to the side and noticed the ever-growing tower of empty bowls next to Naruto. Where do you stuff all this food? She could not help but ask. He stopped his ravenous devoration of the ramen in front of him. A moment later, he had chewed and gulped down the food in his mouth so he could answer. I used to have a problem with that when I was a kid. I got stuffed way too quickly. Then I started taking my training seriously, he said. She frowned at him. That's not a real answer. How does training help you fit so much into your stomach? You should be bloated right now. Naruto scratched his chin and answered. I've never been big on the academic stuff, but isn't matter just energy in another form? My training takes a lot out of me, so I get my energy back by eating a lot. It doesn't work like th, protested Kaneko. She stopped and thought. Her retort felt not entirely true. If a human of her body type and size ate as many sweets as she did, they would rapidly get fat. Being a devil afforded her some control over her appearance, but that ability took power. Naruto was at least partially right, since food really did get turned into energy, just not quite like he described. Okay, it does, but not that fast or that directly. What you're describing works for devils, not humans. And you're a human, she pointed out. He snorted and said. What's to stop a human from training? After you've reached a certain level, it's easy to do it. She pondered that statement and resumed eating. He did the same, inhaling even more ramen. And so, their silence returned for a while. Several minutes were spent like that until they were both finished with eating. Once Kaneko was done trying out the menu, she filled out the question form her contractor had given her. It was surprisingly alike to the questionnaires devils handed out after the fulfillment of a contract. It made sense from a certain point of view, but it was also somewhat suspicious. Am I the first devil you summoned? She asked. He shook his head and said. Nope. Some guy I accidentally summoned when I toured Africa was the first one. A bit stuck up, but friendly. He helped me with a bit of trouble I had with a local warlord. I paid with a few old gold pieces I had on hand. Apparently, they were counterfeit Ryo, but it was still gold, so he took the payment. That's when he explained devil contracts and valid forms of payment to me. That explains the questionnaire, she said. It looks a lot like the ones we hand out. It does, yeah. I modeled it after yours, he admitted. Speaking of which, I gotta fill that out. I don't want to keep you here longer than I need to. You feel a bit tired. An echo nodded absentmindedly before she handed him his completed questionnaire and the empty one for her contract. She was kind of tired. Between school, exercise and the contracts, she was pretty much done. If even a human could tell that she was exhausted, then. Her thoughts came to a screeching halt. He had said that she felt tired. Felt, not looked. She warily turned to him and braced herself for a confrontation. What do you mean by feel? He lifted his hands. I don't want to pick a fight, though I'll agree to a spar anytime. While we're at it, I could also teach you how to properly use your chakra. It fluctuates too easily with your emotions and makes you easy to read, he answered her. You can use chakra. She shouted. Then she looked around for the kitchen staff. Before she could get far with her thoughts, Naruto answered. Of course. Why do you think the cook and the server don't comment on our talk? He then handed her the questionnaire, which he had filled out without her noticing. After that, he made a strange hand sign with his right hand and said. It was nice having you here, believe it. See ya. The whirlwind engulfed him out of nothing after he had finished speaking. Not a moment later he was gone, leaving behind a very confused Nekashu. I need to tell the president about this, she murmured. Naruto Uzumaki was old. It was not odd for the people of his clan to live well past a hundred, the youngest natural death of any clan member was a man aged 97. But even by the standards of his ancestors, he was ancient. In fact, he was so old that he barely even remembered his age. And yet, he looked no older than when he had been 30. The reason behind this went a lot further than genetics. His ancestry still played a large role. 
he was the inheritor of Ashura Atsutsuki's spirit, which had enhanced his already powerful life force. Even then, he should not have made it past 200 years, an age which he had eclipsed a very long time ago. The true reason for his longevity lay a bit further back than Ashura. It was the man's father, Hagoromo Atsutsuki, who had made it possible. Hagoromo was the sage of the Six Paths, a being of nigh incomparable power and wisdom to the people of his home. He was also Naruto's ancestor, which had allowed him to appear before Naruto during the Fourth Great Shinobi World War, for Hagoromo had done the impossible and transcended death. After his demise, he had gained the ability to leave the pure world and track his descendants through their chakra. He had come to Naruto's and his friend rival Sasuke's aid at the conclusion of the war. His appearance had made victory possible. That appearance had planted a seed in Naruto's mind. If Hagoromo could transcend death after dying, was it possible to transcend death before dying? It had taken until his wife and Ada's death at age 77 that he had begun to stop contemplating and start studying. He had loved his wife dearly, loved her even more still, and he had not been able to bear the reality of being parted from her for the several decades it would have taken for death to claim him as well. And so, he had figured that if transcending death allowed the dead to leave the pure world and return to it, it would also allow the living to visit the pure world. It had taken him 20 years to achieve his goals. Most of it had been spent trying to find a way to summon Hagoromo, or Old Man Super Sage as Naruto called him, and get an explanation. Even more time had been spent trying to convince the old man to help him. Naruto had only ever received partial answers. As such, he had been forced to consult with Orochimaru, a mad scientist, who had thankfully begun the process of turning into a decent human being. The man's quest for immortality had yielded surprising success, but he had known very little of transcendence. Still, his knowledge of the Shinigami Mask in the Uzumaki Mask Temple had been the solution to the problem. The pact with the Shinigami later and Naruto had transcended death. The price, however, had been steep. The Shinigami had charged him with mercenary work. Being a shinobi, Naruto had not minded much, but the sheer volume and difficulty of the work had been staggering. These problems had traditionally been taken care of by the Shinigami itself, and the level of difficulty truly was worthy of a divine being. The problem the Shinigami saw itself confronted with was the security of the world. That had been as true then as it was now. Back then, however, that problem had been far more dire. As the only being of its power level, it had been the only defense against outsiders, which were beings that crossed the boundaries between worlds. Worlds, not planets. The Shinigami had had trouble holding the line, and it had needed a helper. Naruto had been that helper. He had realized early on that his power, although considered nigh insurmountable by his fellow shinobi, had barely sufficed to endure the weakest of onslaughts from the outsiders. The one saving grace there had been their disunity, as they had belonged to many different factions. The constant struggle against such supreme power had allowed him to grow stronger with each encounter, and his morale had been maintained by frequent visits to his wife and family in the pure world. In time, he had grown strong enough to stand at the Shinigami's side as its equal. And then, after eons of fighting, the invasions had slowly petered out until they had stopped entirely. The Shinigami had then released Naruto from its service. Both parties had fulfilled the conditions of the pact. They had also formed a strange but comfortable friendship between them. Naruto had nonetheless had the wish to leave the Shinigami's side then. He had not had the chance to keep up with the times as much as he would have liked, and he had wanted to familiarize himself with all the new jutsus and technologies. So had passed many centuries on top of the millennia he had spent defending his world, and he had grown wary of it. His desire to discover new things had thus led him to explore the vast stretches of his homeworld, but also other worlds. And although he always made frequent trips back to his own world, the exploration of others had become Naruto's way of life. This had ultimately led him to where he was now. This strange world that looked like so many others, Earth was a very frequently occurring planet across many different worlds, had a strange pull for him. He had set foot on it in Africa and stumbled through the continent for over a year, before he had familiarized himself somewhat with the quirks of this world. Copious amounts of time had been spent on studying all sorts of things, including these sacred gears this world seemed to love so much. They were all over the place in Africa, and he had been curious to see if that was the case for the rest of the world too. He had then taken trips across the globe until he had ended up in Japan. What had pulled him here was the above average frequency of chakra users. He would have gone to Kyoto if he had not known that it would have resulted in political problems. Instead, he had wandered through the country and eventually settled in a town with only one, sometimes two, distinct chakra signatures. Was this person a master? If so, he wanted to learn what he could from them. As powerful as he was, there were always new discoveries to be made. Was it a novice? In that case he would teach. It had been an awfully long time since he had last taught an apprentice. All he knew was that the person had to be a devil. The chakra he was sensing had their distinct coloring imprinted on it. 
figuring out their status was now a small passion project of his. There were other passions in his life, however. One of them was ramen. He had never been able to let go of his obsession with the food of the gods and its intricacies. It was no wonder, then, that he began setting up a ramen shop that would serve the divine delicacy of Ichiraku recipes. He would have to frequently verify the standards of the products, of course. It was there that a thought occurred to him. He could combine his passion for ramen with his passion for the study of chakra. Now let's see about getting a contract flyer. He said with glee. Hineko had hurried to the occult research club building as fast as her teleportation spell had been able to be cast. It was late and everyone had already gone home, but that was what led her here. Ria's lived in the orc building, although that would change very soon. For now, she was still there. That made it convenient to find her when something important had to be reported. To be fair, it must have seemed like less of a convenience for Ria's herself when Kaneko barged into the building and banged on her door. President. She called. The busty Ritid's groggy voice called back. Who is it? Kaneko answered the younger girl. The door promptly opened. Ria's was dressed for bed like she always was, which was to say. Not at all. Kaneko spent half a second jealously regarding the gorgeous naked girl in front of her. She discarded any thoughts about that instantly, though. She was here for a reason. What's wrong? Asked Rias. You normally wouldn't bother me if it weren't important. The white-haired girl nodded and said. I encountered a strange man on my last contract. From there, she recounted what had happened on her last job of the day. The strangeness of the request did not register as particularly alarming, there were many weirder requests coming in daily. What raised eyebrows was what had happened at the tail end of it. That's good you came. To think that a supernatural being could sneak into Kuo without our notice, again. That is cause for concern, said Rias. What should I do now? Asked Kaneko. The redeed paused and thought for a short moment. Then, she instructed. If you get another contract from him, I'll come along. Don't go alone. Okay, replied Kaneko. Rhea smiled softly at her. Now that that's done with, why don't you stay the night? You shouldn't be out alone at night. Kaneko knew that that was a lie. She was fully capable of taking care of herself, and her apartment was not far away from Kuo Academy. She suspected that Rhea simply wanted to cuddle. They had done that a lot when she had been new to the peerage, a scared little girl in dire need of affection. That, and Rias liked cuddling something or someone in her sleep. Hein, said Kaneko. As soon as she was finished speaking, she was pulled into a tight hug. That resulted in her face being sandwiched between the older girl's well-proportioned breasts. Rias was surprisingly shameless about her body around those she trusted. Kaneko only wished it would involve fewer instances of having her own inadequacies shoved right into her face, literally. It only got worse from there for the Nekashu. Ria's was a clingy sleeper, which was expected, but she had apparently also picked up the habit of talking in her sleep. That alone would not have been so bad, but the subject matter of her words left Kaneko with images she did not want to have in her head. Oh, Issei, mumbled Ria's in her sleep. Kaneko covered her ears as best she could. She did not want to hear about the pervert while she was trying to sleep. The boy was far kinder than she had initially expected, but he was still a lecher, and she really did not need to hear a live commentary of her master's wet dreams involving him. Sadly, it was not to be. Do that again, came Rhea's low voice as she hugged Kaneko tighter. You're the worst, glowered the white-haired girl in her thoughts. In another part of Kuo, Issei Hiyadu suddenly awoke bathed in cold sweat. He had the bad feeling that somebody was directing their malice at him. What did I do? He asked himself. The next morning saw a very irritated, sleep-deprived Kaneko devouring a stick of Pocky in silence. She had not been able to get a lot of sleep. Ria's apparently had a very active imagination, much to the younger girl's detriment. Next time she needed help from the orc president, she would not agree to a sleepover again. Kaneko. Are you alright? Asked Ria's. Contrary to the other girl, the redeed was well rested and full of energy for the day. Kaneko gave her a short answer. You talk in your sleep. She left it at that, and Rias did not press any further, although she briefly looked a bit sheepish. Still, the problem of sleepiness remained. Rias sighed. You can take off from doing contracts today. Get some rest tonight, said Rias. Thanks, President, responded Kaneko. As it turned out, the promised rest would be needed. The school day was unusually tough, and Kaneko had a hard time concentrating on the material. By the time it was over, she was almost nodding off. Fortunately, the last matter of the day was club activity, which meant she could go home after the initial briefing. While Gasper was, as usual, missing, the other members of the orc were present. Kiba, who was considered the prince of Kuo Academy by the predominantly female student body, wore his usual smile. Another perpetual smiler was Akeno, perhaps the only woman bustier than Ria's this side of Japan. She was also providing tea for everyone. 
Situated on the couch was Ashia, a former nun of very gentle disposition. Next to her sat Issei, the resident pervert and the current Red Dragon Emperor. He also made a lewd face while staring at Akeno and the last member of the group aside from Kaneko. Riaz, the club president. This sort of scene was slowly becoming familiar. Please listen, everyone, began Riaz. Kaneko brought something important to my attention last night. There is a new supernatural presence in town. His name is Naruto Uzumaki, average height, blonde hair and fairly muscular, although not to the degree of a bodybuilder. He can also use chakra, an ability that is normally restricted to yaokai. He made a contract with Kaneko yesterday and revealed himself to her. So far, we don't know if he's hostile or not, but he has shown friendly conduct as of now. I want you to be on the lookout for him while you do your jobs. Issei then asked, does that mean he's dangerous? Riaz turned her head to Kaneko, who answered. I don't think so, but he might be. It's possible that he's strong. He offered to teach me about chakra. As I have told Kaneko, if you encounter him, contact me immediately, finished Riaz. Yes president, was the chorus of responses. Good. Then let's go. We have work to do. Kaneko, stay please, said Riaz. A bit annoyed that she could not go home to rest immediately, Kaneko waited for her master to address her again. She only hoped it was embarrassing. About last night, I'm sorry I disturbed your sleep. You said I talked. What did I say? Asked Riaz. There was a faint air of embarrassment about her. Kaneko was a bit too sleep deprived to measure her response and said. You kept saying Issei's name. Enthusiastically. There was now a bright blush on Ria's face, which she promptly buried in her hands in mortification. I'm sorry. I know you don't like him, so I apologize for making you listen to that, she said. This is embarrassing. The younger girl. I don't dislike him, too much. He's courageous and a reliable friend. Sadly, he's also an idiot and a pervert. To be fair, the last part was not a deal breaker. Many devils were perverts, and if she was honest, she had to admit that the biggest sexual deviant of the peerage was Akeno, not Issei. The latter's problem was the manner in which he expressed it. At least he was being honest about it, but it was still very much an acquired taste. It can be annoying, conceded Riaz, but it's also a bit endearing. The way he looks at me is adorable. Hasten point on the deviancy front, Riaz was apparently also a pervert. Go figure, thought Kaneko. Out loud, she said. How is that different from Riser? The two are quite similar. Riaz shook her head and retorted. Riser saw me as a trophy, a source of prestige. Issei sees me as an object of desire, not for the Gremory name, but for me. For your body, corrected Kaneko. Well, I do have quite the beautiful body, don't I? I don't mind him desiring it. But that's not the only thing he likes about me. He shows genuine affection. You know that, argued Riaz. Kaneko was reminded of the nature of devils. They were beings of sin, and each one had at least one favorite sin to follow. Kaneko's own sin was gluttony, Akeno's was lust, and Ria's was pride with a hint of vanity. Being an object of desire was not the meaning to her, so long as that desire came from someone she did not dislike, and was backed by an otherwise palatable personality. I guess, said Kaneko. Just don't moan his name into my ears again. There was now a renewed blush on Ria's face. She apologized once more. I'm sorry about that. Kaneko shook her head. It's okay. Sorry for being snippy. I'm tired. The redeed quickly regained her composure. She nodded and said. Apology accepted. Go home now. I've kept you here long enough. Rest well, and don't forget your assignment once you're up and running again. Yes president. Things happen fast over the next few days. Ria's moved in with Issei, Akeno was getting all giggly for some reason, and Kaneko found herself being led around by the nose. That last part irritated her quite a bit. Wherever she went, she could see signs of activity from the blonde human who had become the target of investigation. She would see flashes of his hair, only to find nothing when she turned around. From time to time, she found coupons for a bowl of ramen, randomly laying on the ground right in front of her. One time, a blonde woman of very rare sight around these parts, even handed her a flyer advertising the ramen bar where her contract had been completed. It mirrored the way Arias handed out e-contracts perfectly. Kaneko was sure that he wanted to send her a message in this convoluted manner. Essing the content of this message was rather easy. The coupons were a big hint. The question was whether to follow the trail of breadcrumbs or not. The decision was ultimately taken out of her hands when she presented one of the coupons to Rias. The redeed was a Japanophile of the highest caliber, so she convinced herself in record time that she should check out the locale for the dual purposes of experiencing Kuo's unique flavor of the Japanese ramen culture and scouting out a person of interest at the same time. There was no stopping Ria's from dragging her along on this endeavor. If nothing else, we'll get to eat for free. That's something, thought Kaneko to herself. They found themselves again at the shop in short order. 
It was not all that hard to find, which made sense from a business perspective. Said business seemed to be booming too. There were many customers either sitting at the bar or at one of the tables. Finding a spot for themselves proved to be difficult up until they found an empty table with a sign on it that read, regulars only with the image of a coupon beside it. Believing that this was the right course of action, Kaneko and Ria sat down there. Only moments later, a server came to their table. After they handed him their coupons and took their orders, they waited for a bit. Their orders arrived promptly. This is delicious, said Ria's. Kaneko only nodded and focused on her food. That was one thing that could be said about the place. The food was superb. It was only after they had finished that something interesting happened. The one who came to collect their dishes was not the server from before, but the financial backer of the business himself. Naruto Uzumaki. He grinned at them and said. I was wondering when you'd show up. To be honest, I expected you to do so sooner. I would have if you'd summoned me again, said Kaneko bluntly. Now where's the fun in that? Asked Naruto rhetorically. In any case, hello again. And this must be your king, right? Riaz nodded. That's right, she said. The blonde man clapped and said. Great. That saves some time. Oh? Why do you say that? Asked Riaz. Well, I guess you wouldn't let the little one learn from me without checking if I'm trustworthy. I may have been an idiot in my youth, but I'm still smart enough to figure that out, answered Naruto. Paneko glared at him. Don't call me little. I'm 16. He raised an eyebrow and replied. I'm more than 10 times your age. To me, you'll be a little one until you're 40. Be that as it may, your assumption is correct, interrupted Ria's before he could call her little too. I want to see for myself that your offer to teach my adorable servant is not a trap. While Kaneko was somewhat annoyed to have her own protestations undermined by her master, Naruto simply smiled and assured them. No problem. Follow me. I'll bring you to my training ground. The three of them then departed for the back area of the shop. Thanks to a number of seals, none of the customers bothered to question their behavior, nor the entirely suspicious scene of a, seemingly, 30 years old man disappearing into the back area with two high school girls. Naruto was not in the mood to be accused of being a creep. His chosen form of exit was simply the most convenient way to reach the training ground without being noticed. Hineko recognized the storage area where she had been summoned for the original job. It looked mostly the same as before, but now there was some sort of symbol array painted on the ground. It was a bit larger than the teleportation circle in the orc building. She wondered if it served a similar purpose. The symbols on it were strange and unfamiliar, however. Please stand on the circle. It's the fastest way to get to our goal, said Naruto. They tentatively followed his instructions and stepped into the circle. Once he saw that they were fully inside, Naruto performed a series of hand signs. Reverse summoning jutsu, he said, more to inform them than out of necessity. The cloud of white smoke engulfed the three. When it cleared, the two girls were left staring at their surroundings. They could see that they now stood in a clearing in the middle of a forest. There was a small waterfall at one end of the clearing. The grass, the trees and even the water from a small nearby stream that contained the waterfall seemed positively vibrant. It was a wondrous place. Where are we? Asked Riaz. Naruto laughed and answered. That's a secret. It's safe, though. Hineko was too distracted to pay attention to the conversation. She was entranced not only by the beauty of this place, but also by its feeling. As much as she feared Senjutsu, her natural affinity for it screamed at her that this place was full of natural energy and life. It felt free of all taint. To a Nekashu like her, this clearing came close to paradise. She had not known that a place like this could exist. It's so peaceful here, she whispered. Naruto smirked. Yep. I cleaned up the natural energy myself. It makes teaching Senjutsu a lot easier. Hineko swallowed empty air. You want to teach me senjutsu? She asked in a small voice. He frowned at her and said. Eventually, but you don't seem to like the idea. Don't worry about it. It's too soon anyway. You first need to know the basics of chakra. Why, she began, someone I knew went insane while using senjutsu. I don't want the same thing happening to me. He blinked at her. Huh. I knew a guy who was like that as well. In his case, it was the result of improper balance and some sort of complicated enzyme or whatever in the bloodstream. The method I learned has other risks. But let's leave that alone for now. It's time to teach you a thing or two about chakra. Kaneko perked up at hearing that. She asked. Where do we begin? I think it makes the most sense that we start with what you know, he answered. I don't know much. I haven't used yujutsu since I was very young, she told him. So, she did the next best thing. She tried to remember the very few lessons she had had in the past with her sister. Slowly, she roused her chakra. She made sure not to exert too much control over its flow or to stimulate her aura with it, lest she accidentally perform senjutsu. It was easier than she had thought, actually. 
She had not done this in such a long time that it surprised her how quickly she had managed to set some chakra free. Weird, muttered Naruto. What do you mean? Asked Rias from the sidelines. Is something wrong with Kaneko? Naruto hummed and said. Can't say. Her chakra is almost 100% physical energy. The split should be around 50 50s. The flow is also not like it should be. I can't detect a chakra pathway system in her body. It's no wonder that people go insane using Senjutsu if that's the state they're trying it in. That statement shocked both Kaneko and Rias. The Nekashu asked. Does that mean I can't learn techniques from you? Not as you are, said Naruto, but my ancestor Hagoromo Atsutsuki invented a technique that creates a chakra pathway system and others. I can use it on you if you want. Are there any risks? I will not allow you to endanger my servant, I'll have you know, questioned Rias. As bossy, greedy and perhaps even a bit arrogant she could be, Rias cared a great deal for her peerage. She loved them like family. There was no way she would ever let someone inflict grievous harm on any of them. Fortunately, Naruto shook his head. There are no risks involved. I do have to warn you, though. It's an intense experience for first-timers. First-timers? Asked Kaneko. Yeah. The creation of the pathways is just a side effect of the technique. Ninshu that's its name is a sacred practice to its followers, answered the blonde man. Are you one of those followers? Asked Rias. Naruto nodded and said. Yes, but not of the original doctrine. My school of Ninshu is the will of fire, if you want to know. And before you worry, Kaneko won't be forced to do anything. I'll still teach her what it's all about, but there's no big religious dogma involved. Alright. If Kaneko wants to, she can learn, allowed the redeed. I want to, for the pathways if nothing else, said the girl in question. A cheerful grin came upon Naruto's face. He held out his fist to her and said. Great. In that case, bump it. She hesitantly lifted a hand of her own and formed it into a fist. She bumped it lightly against his and noted that it seemed to stick. Then, he spoke. Ninshu is the path to understanding. Brace yourself. Suddenly, Kaneko felt something seep into her. A strange but comfortable heat crawled up her arm, through her shoulder, into her heart and then all throughout her body. It felt kind of pleasant, but when it finally reached her head, she gasped. And then, she understood. The man before her was pouring his spirit into her, and through it she could see the shape of his character. He was kind, loyal to a fault, and so full of life. Her senses were overwhelmed by it, in fact. It seemed impossible for any being to have this much life within their body, and the strength of his spirit was equally impressive. The weight and volume of his chakra dwarfed hers to a ridiculous degree. She was half a drop of water before all the seas combined. She was not afraid though. There was not a single doubt in her mind that this man was a good person. As suddenly as it had come, the feeling of epiphany disappeared. She gasped for air, noticing only a few seconds later that her fist was no longer touching his. The strange heat still persisted, but it was dying down to a gentle warmth. The biggest thing she was left with, however, was a feeling of confusion. What was that? Asked Kaneko with a low voice. The most basic ability of chakra is to connect energies. When physical and spiritual energy are combined, you get amplified combat grade chakra. But you can also connect the energies of different people. Our spiritual energies were connected for a short moment just now. You saw who I was, and I saw who you were. I gotta say, you're one of my most interesting students yet, explained Naruto with a grin. You read my thoughts. Exclaimed Kaneko. He burst out laughing. No way. Ninshu reads the spirit, not the mind. With practice, you can tell what the other feels, but not what they think. Mind reading with chakra techniques is possible, though that only works when the target is restrained. Not like I needed. What's that supposed to mean? Asked Kaneko. There was a broad grin on his face again. That would be telling. Maybe you'll figure it out at some point. For now, let's get started with the lesson. Kaneko straightened up and paid attention. As irritating as his refusal to answer was, she understood that people kept secrets. What's first? The absolute basics of the chakra-based shinobi arts, answered Naruto. I could teach you the techniques of the monks or of the samurai, but they're a bit simple and restrictive. In other words, they're boring. Shinobi? Asked Rias with raised eyebrows. He was throwing around terms that should have been familiar, but she had never heard them connection with chakra. Yeah. Not quite like the ones you're used to, though. Sure, stealth is important, but black ops stuff is reserved for specialists like the Anbu units. Most shinobi where I come from are main force combatants, elaborated the whiskered man. So it's straight into sparring? Asked Kaneko. Naruto nodded and said. Almost. I hated being stuck in a classroom, so I'm going to keep the theory to a minimum. We'll start with the three main types of shinobi arts. Taijutsu, Genjutsu and Ninutsu. The first one self-explanatory, Genjutsu are illusions that only work against people with chakra, and Ninjutsu is everything else. 
both genjutsu and ninjutsu require hand signs to stimulate the chakra flow. From what I know, they're almost the same as the ones these Anyaji guys use. Are they necessary? That sounds like a big drawback, asked Kaneko. At the start. Yeah. You can cut them down with practice. Otherwise, no one would use the water dragon jutsu. 44 hand signs for a B-rank technique are a bit much, answered Naruto. And it's not much of a drawback if you're fast enough. There are worse ones, doing maths during battle like those magicians sounds more impractical, for example. Both Kaneko and Riaz had to concede that point. It was a big distraction to do that. There was one thing to add, however. Many spells can be put on paper as pre-calculated, or so I have heard, said Riaz. Naruto pulled out a slip of paper with symbols drawn on it. He slapped it on a rock and threw it in the air. Once it had reached sufficient height, he made a single hand sign. Same with chakra, he said. Boom. A big explosion occurred in the sky. The shockwave ruffled the leaves of the trees and the blades of grass in the clearing. Naruto elaborated. Fuinjutsu is a sub-discipline of ninjutsu. It's also my family's specialty. You don't need magic when you have chakra, believe it. Interesting, muttered Riaz. Wow, said Kaneko. Naruto merely grinned again and said. Right then. Let's start with the hand signs. And so, the first of many lessons for Kaneko began, with far-reaching consequences for the world. There was something strange going on with Senjutsu in this world, Naruto thought. It still utilized natural energy, but it did so as an afterthought. For the locals, it was all about the manipulation of life energy within themselves and in others. They could use to amplify their strength, to heal, and to purify. The big problem with that approach was that they skipped the middle step. Contrary to that, the method he had learned had relied on not only drawing in natural energy, but also properly balancing it. Of course, there was the drawback of potential petrification to consider with that approach. He still deemed that better than risking insanity with every use of senjutsu, just because it was the quicker method to get to life energy. After all, life was simply a part of nature, not nature in its totality. Manipulation of life energy had been one of the most advanced topics of Toad-style Senjutsu, precisely because the school put so much emphasis on mastering natural energy first. The difference between the two styles explained a lot. Toad-style and all the other styles of Naruto's homeworld emphasized the proper absorption of natural energy. This purified it and rid it of the emotional taint it bore. Conversely, this world relied on letting the natural energy pass through the body, which left the taint intact, but also eliminated the risk of petrification. The latter method sadly also resulted in overall much weaker senjutsu. That was also the reason why the practice was not highly regarded beyond Nichusa's. Research on senjutsu had been hard because of how undervalued it was in this world. He had had to send hundreds of shadow clones on covert missions to steal liberate the barebones information needed to figure out just why natural energy was drawn towards his new student and why she considered senjutsu so dangerous. Knowing these things was necessary for a good training regimen and he only wanted the best for his student. It had been this effort that had delayed his second meeting with Kaneko. It was good that he had done that. Initially, he had planned to wait for several years before teaching her senjutsu. That would have been a horrible idea, however. If she had been a human, the original approach would have been perfectly alright, but Kaneko was a Nekashu. That piece of information had been hard to come by, but the name of this subset of Nekamata had come up in his research for unusually high senjutsu affinity. Unless she was at least a century old, she could not have possibly been any other yaokai and have an affinity this high. And so, he had looked more into Nekashu. The things he had found out about them concerned him greatly. There were only two known Nekashu left in the world, one of which was a wanted criminal. That meant that Kaneko was essentially the last of her kind, all alone in a world where nobody could understand a Nekashu's struggle. Said struggle was another point of concern. Nekashu needed natural energy to develop properly, yet Kaneko was actively rejecting natural energy out of fear. She was already lagging behind in physical development, and if she continued this rejection, she would eventually stunt herself permanently. That sort of thing was not something he could allow. He may not have known her for long, but Naruto considered her his responsibility. She was his student, and no student of his would be allowed to cripple herself on his watch. He still pondered ways to make a training regimen that would get her to accept senjutsu in the near future, when he reoriented his attention towards the girl. She sat before him with closed eyes. Her hand slowly went through the hand signs he had shown her. Her face, despite its superficially stoic appearance, was scrunched up in intense concentration as she tried to follow his lesson. She seemed to be having success, seeing as her speed increased with every repetition. The purpose of the exercise was twofold. Not only was it about memorizing the hand signs themselves, but it was also about feeling out how the signs affected the flow of chakra. This was the basis of correctly molding the chakra in the shape and quantity necessary for a jutsu. 
the memorization of these chakra flow patterns was also what enabled advanced practitioners to forego the hand signs. He had explained as much to Kaneko, who now diligently worked to rake in the benefits of this training. You're doing great. You'll have it down in no time, believe it. He praised. While well, Kaneko's usually stoic face took on a small smile, Ria's, who had been observing the whole lesson so far, asked. What's with the verbal tick? He looked at her strangely and asked back. Are you asking because you're curious or because you're bored? Ria's opened her mouth, closed it, then opened it again. The realization of the rude nature of her question appeared to embarrass her. She sighed in resignation before she said. Both. Naruto smirked at her and said. I got the tick from my mother if you're curious. If you're bored, I've just wasted your time. In any case, you're welcome. He turned his head to Kaneko and said. Good job. Maintain concentration, even when there are distractions. Indeed, even while he and Rias had been talking, Kaneko had kept up with the practice. There were one or two lapses, but she had not broken the flow of hand signs, and her chakra was moving as it was supposed to. She was a diligent student. It's fun, you know. He said softly. Rias looked at him and asked. What is? He grinned and answered. Teaching a student, seeing them grow, that's true satisfaction. I've had many students over the years, but that feeling of pride when they reach a milestone never gets old. You must feel something like that too, right? Rias nodded. Yes. My servants are family to me. Their accomplishments make me proud. That was the thing that broke Kaneko's concentration at last. She was blushing slightly from the praise. It felt good to be valued. Look forward to being proud, then. Kaneko's gonna go far if she keeps up this level of progress. I think that's enough of this exercise for today, though, said Naruto as he looked at his student. I can keep going, she said. He nodded, but he countered. You could, but nobody can keep up their concentration all day. Instead, let's bar a bit. I'm here to teach you taijutsu as well, you know. Isn't it a bad idea to interrupt her progress? Asked Riaz. Naruto laughed. You'll see, he said. Kaneko, come at me. He then took on broad stance and waited for Kaneko to do the same. She raised her fists and took on her own stance. Naruto looked it over, noticing the obvious gaps in them. She looked a bit like a boxer, just a bit more grounded. It was a good beginning, but it was not suited for battle with a close combat specialist who knew what they were doing. That was fine, though. The purpose of sparring was to find such mistakes and correct them, as well as trying out new things. Hineko leapt at him and threw a punch. Naruto caught it. It had decent force and would definitely have sent the average Genin to the Iryanin. Sadly, it was oddly slow for how much impact it had. Perhaps it had to do with the effects of those evil pieces he had heard about. He would have to go over the books again if that was the case. As it was, her punch was flawed. He waited with retaliation, though, since he wanted to see how she would follow up. The second punch came at him, this time from the other fist. It was blocked again, and Naruto noted that it had the same force as the other one, which meant that Kaneko had not neglected one side in favor of the other in her physical conditioning. A series of more punches followed, all of which were deflected or blocked. The rising kick she then made was a bit of a surprise, but it was clear that this was not a preferred type of attack. You're not the worst I've seen, he said, but there's still a lot of room for improvement. Hineko stopped her assault when he began speaking. She frowned, but nodded. It's why I wanted a teacher. I need to get stronger. He laughed softly and said. I won't disappoint you, believe it. Before we continue, have you noticed something? She frowned in thought. After a second, she swung her fists again. She went through several other movements. When she directed one of her punches against a tree at the edge of the clearing, she broke it, splintering it at the base. She had expected such a result, but what she had felt while punching was new. Her eyes widened in realization. My chakra flows with every move, she said in awe. Naruto clapped and confirmed. You got it. Once you get enough of a feel for your chakra, it follows along with your movements and strengthens your body actively and passively. It starts slow at first, but your power and resilience will grow even without active use of chakra. It just needs to move with you while you train. That's amazing, said Riaz. That's why I switched to sparring. It trains the chakra flow too, he said. Hineko looked at him and commented. I like it. He grinned at her. Great. Now come at me again. This time, I'll fight back. Their sparring session continued for about half an hour. Naruto tested Kaneko's technique, strength, endurance, and stamina. She was not bad for an amateur, certainly better than he had been right out of the ninja academy. That said, she was also far away from being an expert. At least he now had an idea how to continue with her training. Alright, let's stop here, he said after he had unbalanced her yet again. I can continue, said Kaneko. I'm just winded. He chuckled and said. We could continue until you fall over, but don't you have contracts to do? Kaneko deflated at that. 
Riaz, however, agreed. I was just about to say that. We've spent more time here than I had anticipated. Let's go back to the club building. The white-haired girl sighed. You're right. That's not all bad. I now have a good idea of where you are and how to continue. Let me hammer out a training regimen. When we train next, I'll have a few things prepared to help you, said Naruto. Okay, said Kaneko. She seemed satisfied with that. He smiled once more. Good. Let me send you on your way then. A few more days went by. During that time, Ashi and Riaz had struck up a weird kind of rivalry which had, at first, confused Kaneko a great deal, but then she had figured out what it was about. Apparently, they were competing for Issei's attention. There was no accounting for taste, she thought. The one fun thing that had sprung up from that had been the club gatherings at the boy's house. His mother had enjoyed embarrassing Issei by showing old photos of his childhood to everyone. That had been fun until Yudo had seen that one photo with a sword in it. Ever since that day, Yudo had been withdrawn and scatterbrained. He did not pay attention to what was happening around him. It had honestly become a big problem. The distracted state of mind he was in lowered his performance in club activities and training as well. Despite her worry for him, Kaneko could not just stop progressing herself. She had continued to train under Naruto and had made great strides in letting her chakra flow in the desired patterns. He had even begun teaching her control exercises like walking up trees and on water. The practice with Ninshu was coming along nicely as well, her ability to read her mentor's spirit had skyrocketed. Her technique in hand-to-hand -hand combat was improving as well, although the results were not yet that great. The few days under his tutelage had not been enough to lead to significant progress. On top of that, she had not been able to train her combat prowess as much as she wanted to. The preparation for the school's bowl game tournament had taken up too much time. The dodgeball match of the tournament was the point where another issue, the one with Yudo, reared its head. She got a bit of a rise out of how everyone on the opposing team was targeting the pervert, but Yudo's absentmindedness took the fun ride out of it again. He just stood there and did nothing while the whole team did their best to win. Riaz was clearly getting upset the longer this went on. Her temper was probably about to explode. Fortunately, the tension was broken by a sudden development. A ball, which had been thrown harder than strictly necessary, had hit Issei in his family jewels. Kaneko had little pity with him due to his antics, although she would not mock him either. The important thing was that the incident caused the game to be halted to assess his injuries. It would postpone Ria's temperamental outburst. Sadly, there were also consequences for her. Ria's had asked her to take Issei and Ashia to a place where nobody was around. That way, Ashia could use her sacred gear to heal him without witnesses. Kaneko was not happy to be stuck with that job, so she simply dragged the catatonic boy along the floor. To be fair, he probably preferred that over being carried by her, that would have been humiliating for him. She did not pity him, but she was not about to add insult to injury while he was in serious pain. So, she was now stuck observing the theater in front of her. It was hilarious in a cosmic sort of way, but at this point, she was just exasperated. Issei, show me where you're hurt so I can heal you, said Ashia. I can't. Responded the boy. Hineko resisted the urge to roll her eyes. Ashia was woefully oblivious to a lot of things. She had not noticed just where Issei had been hit and had failed to understand the very obvious euphemism Riaz and Akeno had used to describe this. This would have been understandable, given Ashia's sheltered life before coming to Kuo, but she was friends with Aika Kiryu. If there was anyone as perverted as the three dunces, then it was her. So, the former nun's selective lack of knowledge in that area was entirely by design. The blame for Ashia's cluelessness could be laid at that girl's feet. Kiryu, you're the worst, she thought as she watched Issei struggle to give Ashia instructions. The blonde girl was almost in tears at his refusal to show her his injury. It was kind of sweet of him, in a really stupid sort of way. Kaneko did not know why exactly Issei held his worst impulses back so much when it came to Ashia, but he did. Ironically, that was how he upset her. Don't cry. Just use your power around my hips, he managed to say. That did the trick, and his relieved sigh soon followed. It was good to know that Ashia's abilities worked well, even when it was only applied to the general area of an injury. That did not stop the situation from being ridiculous. I have no words for this, said Kaneko. As she watched Ashia give Issei a lap pillow, she was equal parts exasperated and relieved. How those two clueless idiots did not get each other's signals was beyond her. It was like a second-rate romcom was unfolding before her eyes. Love made blind, as the saying went, though Kaneko doubted there was any real love involved just yet. Still, they were her comrades and, dare she say, friends. She was glad that they were in good spirits now. As if to accentuate this, the PA system soon announced. The Occult Research Club wins. That victory in the game had come from an undermanned position. Of the Orc members, only Akeno and Riaz were actively in the game. 
Issei was temporarily out, as were Ashi and Kaneko, Gaspar was, as usual, a no-go, and Kiba was somewhere in Lala Land. The latter would have consequences once the tournament was over. A few hours later, that suspicion was proving true. The club president was not happy with Yudo at all. In fact, she was angry enough to slap him. Are you awake yet? Asked Rias heatedly. As the conversation progressed, Kaneko could not help but worry about him. He was acting strange, and there was clearly something wrong with his mental state. Even the pervert was worried. What's wrong with you today? She asked quietly. He had not heard her, too busy arguing with Issei and Rias to notice. He really was out of it. This did not bode well. Kaneko had a bad feeling about his mood and what it meant for the peerage. No. I'm living so I can seek revenge. I live for the destruction of the Holy Sword Excalibur, she heard Yudo say. Her heart sank. Not long after that disturbing incident came another worrying development. Church agents had visited Issei's home. One of them was apparently also a childhood friend of his, which exacerbated the problem with their presence. They also had holy swords with them, Excalibur fragments to be precise. Yudo was liable to fly off the handle once he found that out. The second meeting with them was about to begin. This time, the whole orc with the exception of Gaspar was assembled. If things went south, they had to be there in force. It was not expected, but exorcists were unpredictable in their dealings with devils. Can I ask you why you're here in Kuo? Asked Rias. Arena explained. It's about Excalibur. The legendary holy sword? Asked Issei. He was a bit ignorant in matters such as this. In this case, it was not his fault, however. It was information he had not been told yet. Rias asked Arena. Could you explain that to him, please? He is new to the supernatural world. Of course, said the girl with the pigtails. The Excalibur of legend does not exist anymore. It was shattered during the Great War. What remained were fragments which were reforged into new swords. Each of them has a different ability, all of which the original sword once had. Sadly, one fragment was lost. Of the remaining six, two were left in the care of the Catholic, Orthodox and Protestant churches respectively. One each has been stolen from the three churches. Zenovia, the girl with the short blue hair, took her sword of her back. The holy power it exuded made the devils shiver. This is Excalibur destruction. Arena took off her wristband in turn, transforming it into a sword. She said. This is Excalibur mimic. It can change its shape into anything the user wants. You shouldn't talk about its abilities in front of devils, admonished Zenovia. We need to build some trust, don't we? We're here to request something of them, after all, countered Arena. Rias interrupted their banter. And what is that request? We are here to retrieve the stolen Excalibur fragments from the fallen angels who are hiding in this town. Failing that, we are to destroy them. If it can't be helped, asset denial is enough, began Zenobia. Pineco frowned. Why were the fallen using Kuo as their hideout again? Did they not know that they could start a war like that? Zenobia went on. The priests the higher up sent and all got killed, so it's up to us now. The church sent priests here without permission. That is unacceptable, protested Rias. Like you devils never sent spies into church territory, shot back the other girl. Trying to defuse the situation, Irina continued where her partner left off. According to the Vatican's information, the culprit behind the theft of the Excalibur fragments is Kakabiel, one of the cadres of the Grigori. The eyes of the devils widened. A cadre was a serious threat. All of them were ultimate class level beings. The presence of Kakabiel posed a serious risk to everyone in the town. I see, said Rias. Are you requesting our assistance, then? Arena shook her head and answered. No. We can't discount the possibility that you're working together with the Fallen. The higher-ups think that weakening the church with the theft of the Excalibur fragments is enough of a motivation for you to ally with them. I can guarantee you that we're not working together with the Fallen, groused Rias. Be that as it may, our request is that you stay out of our fight with Kakabiel, said Zenobia. Rias looked at them seriously and asked. Are you trying to die? This is suicide. We're prepared to die for the mission. Excalibur is more important than our lives, said Irina. I ask once more that you stay out of it. She and Zenovia then stood up and made to leave. On their way to the exit, they suddenly stopped. Zenovia turned around and looked at Ashia. I thought I recognized you. Are you the witch Ashia Argento? She asked. Ashia flinched. That girl did not like being addressed as such. Kaneko was displeased with the address as well, hurting her fellow members of the Grimmery Peerage was unacceptable. She glanced at Issei, who was fuming. If this continued, he was in danger of doing something stupid. I, stammered Ashia. Why have you become a devil and abandoned the teachings of God? Asked Zenobia. Irina said. She hasn't. I can see it on her face. I can practically smell it on her. She still believes in God. I do, said Ashia with tears in her eyes. I still follow God's teachings. My whole life was dedicated to them. 
I can't just abandon them. Dealing a devil, becoming a devil, those things are sins that go against God. If you're still a follower, you let yourself be cleansed. God will forgive your sins, said Zenobia, unwrapping the cloth which covered her sword. Ashia was crying now. That made Kaneko angry. Her sense of decorum held her back from expressing it. Someone else had no such restraint. Shut the hell up and get away from her. Yelda say. How can you say that? She abandoned the church, said Zenobia coldly. The boy was not satisfied in the slightest with that answer. He shouted back. The church abandoned her first. How could anyone throw away such a kind girl just for healing someone? The church didn't even let her have friends. Holy maidens don't need friends. Doing charity work for the community is more important. The love of God is enough, retorted. Then where was it? Where was the love of God when she was lonely and cast out? Yelda say. The girl with a single green bang asked. What is she to you that you defend her like that? She's a comrade. She's family. That's the reason why I'm here for her. If you try to hurt her, I'll protect her. I won't let you lay a single finger on her. He answered. Zenobia's eyes narrowed. You'd go against the church, just like that. Big words from a single devil. Your master needs to teach you better. This was getting out of hand. It was not supposed to come to blows during negotiations. Rhea spotted that danger as well. She said. Issei, that's Enu. If you're going to fight, I might join in as well. I will fight you, declared Yudo. Zenobia looked at him and asked. Who are you? The smirk game upon Kiba's face as he summoned swords with his sacred gear. I'm your senpai. Unlike you, though, I was deemed a failure. There will be no fighting in the club room, declared Riaz. There is a field outside we can put under a barrier. Once issued, the challenge could not be ignored, but Riaz was right in insisting on a change of venue. The place where the peerage had trained for the ball game tournament was chosen as the location of the practice match. On the way there, Riaz negotiated on the terms with Irina, who was clearly the more level-headed of the exorcists. They agreed that no lethal blows or crippling injuries would be allowed. Since there were two exorcists, and because Issei had started the provocation from the devil's side, he was made to participate as well. Honestly, Kaneko had not minded his outburst. Despite being a total pervert, he was quick to come to the defense of his comrades. He had risked life and limb multiple times to aid those he considered important. He had done so for Ashia when Raynor had held her captive, he had done so for Rias during the whole debacle with Riser, and he had been worried for Kaneko too, when she had been taken out during the raiding game. His defensiveness of his comrades was definitely one of his most admirable qualities. It was why she could say that she liked him despite his greatest character flaw. Sadly, however, the flaw was very prominent, and it made it hard not to be angry with him when he showcased it. As the fight began, she could see it happening already. Why must these combat uniforms be this tight? She asked herself as she took in Arena's and Zenobia's outfits. What followed was a painfully pathetic display from both Issei and Yudo. With the former, it was his low power and inexperience that did him in. As for the other side of the field, Yudo's problem was that he could not keep his temper in check. His demonic swords kept getting annihilated, and his technique became sloppier by the second. Neither of the two devils were faring well. Then, she saw Issei's face shift. Irina noticed it too. Kaneko sighed and warned the other girl. Careful. He has a technique that allows him to strip women with just a touch. Hey. No fair. Why are you giving away my secret technique? we're on the same side. He protested. She just stared at him and said. You're the worst. It was a catch for us at this point. He routinely did perverted things, garnering this response from her. On the upside, he had absolutely no ability to hide his lewd intentions, which made it easy to avoid them. That said, even if his behavior was worthy of criticism, he derived his motivation from lewd thoughts and activities. Pace in point, as he chased a frantic arena around the field, his speed and technique improved. He was still only at two boosts, but his performance was almost impressive. Irina was having a hard time evading him. In fact, it was getting to the point that she had to dodge more than deflect. And then, when Irina had backed herself up until she was just in front of Kaneko and Ashia, she ducked, and disaster struck. Issei sailed through the air above the ducking exorcist. He flew right through the barrier, and his hands touched the shoulders of his two fellow devils. His technique activated upon touch. Press break. The clothes Kaneko and Ashia wore were obliterated in an instant. Nothing was left, not even underwear. Ashia tried to cover herself up, crying out. No. Kaneko simply shook with rage and raised her fist. He had gone too far this time, and he was seriously not helping his case with what he was saying. Ko oh, Kaneko, don't be mad. I didn't meant to do that. Well, I did, but not to you and Ashia. It was supposed to hit Arena, but she dodged. Oh, uh, but small boobs are still important so, I suppose I should say, thank you for the view, he said, his voice getting smaller and smaller. 
The glare she sent his way was terrifying. She was struggling to find words for his stupidity, but she eventually did. You complete and total lecher. Then, she punched him in the stomach, catapulting him back inside the barrier. She had not hit him with full force, that would have been irresponsible and dangerous. Nonetheless, he needed to learn his lesson, even if he probably never would. Until such time as he toned down his antics or she stopped caring, she would use force to hammer it home. He had to learn that stripping women did not make them harmless. Yes, it had worked against Riser's peerage, but against someone who had no sense of shame or cared more about winning than their dignity, dress break was useless. Too angry to care worked as well, as Kaneko had just proven. A strategy that relied on that was unreliable, undignified, and obscene. Although it feels kind of nice that he liked the view, a small treacherous part of her thought. She was generally considered cute, not attractive. Although she knew why, that had been a hit to her self-confidence in recent years. So, as stupid and inappropriate as Issei's remark had been, it had been sort of a compliment. It was partly this thought but mostly worry that saw her stay for the remainder of the match. There was a moment of fright when Irina managed to cut Issei with her sword. That could have ended in tears. As angry as she was at him right now, she did not want to see him be vaporized by a holy sword. Fortunately, it had stayed at the level of an injury. It heralded his defeat, however. On Yudo's side, it had not even been that much. The knight was in no condition to win, and by the end of the fight, he was nothing but an exhausted pile of anger. The battle was lost. The two exorcists left their parting comments to their defeated adversaries after that. Zenobia's words towards Yudo were harsh. Senpai, if you'd kept a cool head, you would have fared much better. Gremory, I recommend you have that talk with him I mentioned. Train your servants better as well. Technique can do only so much. Irina told Issei. I'll tell you something. The vanishing dragon has already appeared. You'll meet him at some point, but if you stay like this, he'll defeat you. You hey, wait for me, Zenobia. Well, that would be it, Issei. Call me if you want to get judged for your sins. The wink she sent him was odd, but Kaneko did not care enough about it to say or think much about it. Now that the fight was over, she had more pressing concerns. Since Issei looked like he was not in mortal danger, she could go and fetch a spare uniform to put on. Let's get something to dress, she told Ashia and took her along. Once they had put on their new clothes, they came back to survey the damage. Riaz was talking quite animatedly with Yudo, so he could be left in her hands. Kaneko and Ashia thus decided to go look after the lecher. He was still on the ground, nursing his wound. Sorry you had to see that, Ashia. That didn't look cool at all, he said. Ashia shook her head and said. I'm just glad you did not die. I was afraid you'd vanish after that sword hit you. The wound is thankfully small. His face softened at her words. As she healed his wounds, he spoke again. I'm sorry for destroying your clothes. Hineko was surprised to hear genuine regret in his voice. Well, at least he knew that he should not have done it. It's alright, Issei. You had a plan, didn't you? You fought for me too. I'm fine with anything you do for me, said Ashia. Or to you, deadpan Kaneko in her head. It was hard not to notice how smitten that girl was with Issei. It was both ironic and weird how the target of her affections was so clueless about it. At least he seemed to appreciate Ashia's comment. Speaking of comments, Kaneko had her own to make. If you had boosted again, you might have won. That you didn't notice that means you're too inexperienced. Hopefully, he would take her harsh words to heart. As Kaneko looked away from them, she noticed that someone else was receiving harsh words as well. Wait. Yudo. I won't forgive you if you run away from me. You're my knight. Do you have any idea what you'd do to me if you turn stray stop? Shouted Riaz. Yudo looked back contemptuously and said. My comrades allowed me to escape that day. Their regrets, I need to put them into my demonic swords. Then, he ran. Udo, why? Cried Riaz. Pineko felt like crying too. Udo could not turn stray. If he did, he would be hunted down and killed. On top of it, Ria's reputation would be tarnished as well. It was the lesser of the two concerns, but it was still important. Most of all, if Udo really became a stray devil, he would be lost forever. I can't lose any more people, thought Kaneko. Don't leave me. She could not take being abandoned by someone dear to her again, not after Kuroka. It would destroy her. That could not come to pass. She had to do something. Before that, she needed a plan, and before she could have a plan, she needed advice. Fortunately, she knew where she could get some. Damn. That reminds me of Sasuke, said Naruto. Who? Asked Kaneko. She had come to him as soon as Riaz had dismissed the club. Instead of following their usual training regimen, she had explained the situation to him and asked him for advice. As she was now finished with that, she discussed the situation with him. My first real friend. I had pals before him, but no one who truly understood me, began Naruto. But his obsession for revenge got the better of him. 
He left home, turned rogue, and joined a terrorist organization in a bid to kill his brother. What? Why would he do that? That doesn't make sense. Explained Kaneko. She resented her sister for abandoning her, there was no arguing against that. That did not mean that she wanted Kuroka to die, though. She was her sister, and she loved her despite the pain the thought of her brought on. So, she had a hard time believing how the best friend of her goofball of a teacher could do such a thing. Itachi, Sasuke's older brother, had killed his entire clan except Sasuke years earlier, explained the blonde man. Oh, said Kaneko. That was indeed a reason. Naruto nodded. The thing is, by the time people noticed there was a problem, it was too late. He felt that too few people supported him in his goals and that nobody understood him. I thought I did, but I didn't. So, he went rogue and joined an insane nutcase for the promise of power. If you want to stop that from happening to your friend, you need to find a way to support him without letting him be consumed by revenge. That's going to be tough. I have no idea where to start. Yudo hates holy swords. He hates Excalibur. Destroying them is all he cares about, she told him. Her mentor laughed and said. Then he's being stupid. Tell him you have his back. Guide him through his revenge but keep a hold of him. Keep him from directing his anger in the wrong direction. Pineko frowned and said. But I don't know what the wrong direction is. That's easy. It's the direction he's already going, retorted Naruto. Excalibur is a symbol of his pain, not its source. Find the source, direct his anger at it, and help him let go of it once it's done. Anekashu blinked in surprise. That was enlightening, to say the least. He was right, now that she thought about it. It was not much, but now she had a point from which to start. She smiled. Thank you for the help, Sensei, she said. That's what a teacher is supposed to do, right? I'm here to teach you, and if you need something other than lessons in chakra, then I gotta teach you that, he replied with a grin. We should get back to our exercises, though. Okay, said Kaneko with a nod. What is today's lesson? You said we would start with more advanced things today. He nodded and confirmed. Yes. You've mastered the chakra control exercises we looked at. So, today, we start with senjutsu training. She blinked. Worry settled in her gut. What? Didn't you say it was too soon? What if I lose control? It's alright. Walking on walls and on water has trained your control over chakra sufficiently for us to start with it. And as an additional security measure, I've got this, he said. She saw him pull out a black rod from a bag beside him. He held it in front of her. What's that? She asked. Touch it. She did, and she shivered. There was something weird and unnatural going on with that thing. This is a special device Master Fukasaku used when I learned Senjutsu under him. It can expel all natural energy from the body with a single hit, explained Naruto, though it doesn't work against masters of the art who can control natural energy perfectly. It's a training tool, not one for combat. Hineko was still hesitant about it and asked. Isn't it way too soon to start? I don't feel confident with this. He shook his head and answered. No. If anything, it's almost too late. You would be right if you were an ordinary chakra user, but you're not, you're a Nekashu. She paled. How did you find that out? She asked. I'm a sage, a master of sensing natural energy. I've been at it for thousands of years, he told her. She was shocked at hearing his age. She had only thought he was a few centuries old at best, but this, if that was true, it meant that he knew what he was doing. There were questions, of course, but those took the backseat as he continued his explanation. I sensed how the natural energy around you moves. Figuring out what species of yaokai you were was a question of time at that point. That's why it took me a few days to lure you to my shop after our first encounter. Now that I know what I know, I have to get you started on senjutsu as soon as possible. Nekashu like you are meant to immerse themselves in natural energy, or else your bodies don't develop like they should. Hineko looked at herself. She was short, flat, and had a body that was only beginning to stop looking like a child's. At her age, her sister had already been quite curvy, and until now she had believed that the reason for this was simply individual differences, but if her teacher was correct, she was supposed to look more mature at this point. She grimaced slightly. Are you sure it's not just me? She asked. Yes, he answered with conviction. Your body is starved of natural energy. The only reason you're developing at all is because you're a devil, but you won't be able to keep compensating for long. You absolutely need senjutsu. She sighed in surrender and asked. Okay. How does it work? Eh, hey, it depends on the style, answered Naruto. I was taught by the Toad Sages, but their style might clash with your Nekashu heritage. There is also the style used by Hashirama Senju, the founder of my home village, but the requirements are too stringent. So, I'll have to teach you a neutral style I cobbled together over the centuries. So far, I've never failed to make a student a sage with this method. You'll have it down in no time, believe it. 
The grin he had by the end was reassuring, she found. She nodded at him and said. I'm ready. Good. Then sit down. The first step to mastering senjutsu of any style is to sit completely still. That was the most difficult part for me when I learned, but I have confidence you'll get it sooner than I did. You're not a hyperactive knucklehead, after all, said Naruto. She followed his instructions and sat down. It only took her a short moment to notice that sitting still was indeed hard. The urge to move was there after less than a minute, and small twitches she had never noticed cropped up every now and then. She was making progress, however. Half an hour later, she was completely still. Suddenly, Kaneko felt something. It was around her, permeating the air, and it clung to her. She fought down the urge to react, but a momentary twitch of surprise cost her the focus necessary to keep going. I lost it, she said, somewhat disappointed. Are you kidding? That was great. It took me days to get to that point. You're a natural at this, praised Naruto. Try it again. The young Nekashu stilled again and refocused. When she felt the natural energy around her again, she did not react. It moved towards her on its own, enveloping her and eventually seeping into her skin. As it entered her body, she marveled at its purity. There were no negative emotions captured in the energy. It was as though it unloaded all its baggage before entering her. She felt at peace. There was a tingly feeling in her fingers as she drew in more and more of the energy. It spread to her arms and her shoulders. Then, suddenly, she felt pain on her head, and the feeling was gone. Ow, she said quietly and opened her eyes. What happened? You drew in too much energy. Well, not quite. You drew it in too fast. A whole lot more could have fit into you, but you didn't balance it properly, explained her mentor. Remember that you have to balance three energies in your body, not two. She blinked. Oh, I forgot. Until she had met him, she had thought Chakra was pure life force, physical energy in other words. Then, he had shown her Ninshu and connected her physical energy to her spiritual energy. The two balanced themselves out naturally, so it was easy to forget that they were, in fact, not one and the same. Her mentor just laughed and said. Don't worry about it. I was an idiot back then, and I still got it. I needed an analogy with ice cream of all things to finally understand. In any case, you need to not only draw on the natural energy, you need to join it with the two halves of your chakra and balance it in an equilibrium. If you do that, it will stay balanced until the natural energy dissipates. The lesson continued for another two hours. In that time, Naruto used the rod a few more times, but Kaneko had an extreme aptitude for senjutsu. It was just how Nekashu were built. Her progress was remarkable, and by the end of their session, she was close to truly generating sage chakra. That was great, little one. I'm impressed with your progress, he praised and ruffled her hair. Don't call me little, she protested. He rolled his eyes. We've been over this. I'll call you little until you're 40. She scoffed and said. I'll get you to stop calling me that sooner. We'll see. At least you'll be growing like you should now that you let the natural energy in. That way, you'll stop being a midget soon, he teased. She hit him in the shoulder. Stupid sensei, she complained. He simply laughed at her and said. You're not the first to call me that. I've grown to like it. Now scram, get home, and rest. And think about what I said earlier when we started, okay? She nodded. I will. And she would. With her training done, she could focus on solutions for the problem she had be pondering before it. There had to be a way to help Udo and stop him from going down the deep end. The solution will present itself, you'll see. I'm rarely wrong about stuff like that, believe it. When Kaneko was gone, Naruto took out a phone. Baldwin, it's me. Of course I know what time it is. Listen, the main church is screwed up. I need you to get in contact with Pahalaya. It was not long until the next day off. Kaneko had a bit of free time, as training with Naruto would only begin in a few hours. Despite this, however, she was busy. While walking around town on her way to her favorite sweet shop, she had spotted a say. He looked quite shifty, and, as soon as he had spotted her, he tried to run. Suspicious was the only word fitting to describe that behavior. So, she had taken up pursuit and caught him easily. What are you doing? She asked him calmly. He looked at her nervously as if he was expecting her to hit him. Given her track record with him, that was a fair assumption. She was also still angry with him about the incident during his fight with Arena, so it was not all that strange for him to expect a violent greeting. That was not her intention, however. I was going to meet up with Saji, he answered hesitantly. Her stare almost bored a hole through his skull. With narrowed eyes, she said. I'm coming with you. But, he started. After a second, his shoulders slumped, and he sighed. Fine. With her hand tightly clutching his shirt, Kaneko then followed him to his intended destination. Their walk was fairly short. Although it drew a bit of attention from the onlookers, it was also uneventful. Before long, the two of them stood in front of the train station. 
So I stood there, apparently waiting for a say. So, why did you call me? I want to know that as well. What are you two up to? Asked Kaneko. Saji protested. Hey, I know just as little as you do. Talk, he do. Unperturbed by the other boy's words, Issei said. I want to find Irina and Zenobia and ask them for permission to destroy Excalibur. Saji's and Kaneko's eyes widened as they tried to process that ludicrous statement. Asking two adherents of the church, one of which seemed to be a zealot, to destroy a holy sword, that sounded stupid. Still, there was something to it. You're doing this for Yudo, right? In that case, I'm in, she said. Wait a second. What kind of insane idea is that? And why are you involving me? This is a matter of the occult research club. Protested Saji. Kaneko was also kind of curious what Issei's reasoning was. The two boys did not get along all that well, their first meeting had proven that much. Aw, oh, come on. Said Issei. Saji interrupted him before he could continue. No. Your king may be a loving woman behind a strict exterior, but the council president has a strict exterior with an even stricter woman behind it. She'll kill me if I get involved in this mess. Issei was not giving up, however. He retorted. You're the only devil I can even ask. Ashia can't keep a secret from the president, and Akeno would just straight up tell her and stop me. And Kaneko, she's always so dutiful. I couldn't risk her telling on me. That was a fair point, Kaneko conceded. Under normal circumstances, she would have tattled on him in an instant, but this was about Yudo. She could not let her friend and comrade turn stray. What is the exact plan? She asked. Issei explained. As I said, I want to find Irina and Zenovia. Then we can call Kiba and negotiate. Zenovia said that their mission would also count as completed if the Excaliburs were destroyed instead of retrieved. We could team up. But they declined already, said Kaneko with a frown. It can't hurt to ask again, counter to say. Saji interjected. And what if they get violent? Then you run, answer to say. It would be my fault anyway. If they attack, I'll hold them off. Take Kaneko and flee if that happens. It was in moments like these that Kaneko realized that the idiot was more than just a pervert. He was a loyal friend and a good comrade. He had no care for danger when it came to helping those close to him. He had not hesitated back when she had been ambushed by Freed, and he was not hesitating now. When the chips were down, he was there. It was for this reason that she chose to trust him and go along with his plan. She said. Okay. We can try. Left unsaid was that she had absolutely no intention of leaving him to die if the worst case scenario happened. Members of the Grimmery Peerage did not abandon each other. That was why they were doing this in the first place. You'll get us killed, you damn moron. Shouted Saji. I won't run, reiterated Kaneko. For Yudo's sake, I will help. Don't ignore me. Protested Saji. He was ignored. Then he tried to run. Kaneko grabbed his shirt and dragged him along. There was no escaping for Saji. Let's hurry up and find the exorcists. It won't be easy to find them, said Kaneko. As it turned out, she was wrong. It had taken the unlikely trio all of 20 minutes to find the girls in question. They were on the road, praying and begging. It was both comical and pathetic, really. A small donation for lost lambs of God, please. We ask for charity for the followers of the Heavenly Father. Kaneko stared at the two. Could they be any more obvious? Indeed, Irina and Zenovia did not wear any kind of disguise. All they had were their white robes to wear over their skin-tight combat suits. Zenovia was not even bothering to hid the suspiciously shaped bundle on her back. Even Issei and Saji stared at them in befuddlement at their suspicious appearance. The exorcists did not even notice that they were acting weird. They were too busy with begging and bickering. This is why I don't like going to countries that don't have the smell of our faith. Japan is supposed to be a developed country. How can they show so little faith? Complained Zenobia. Smelling faith. That sounded like complete nonsense, although that unlikely ability had worked when determining Ashia's beliefs. That, or it could just have been complete bullshit, as the saying went. Don't say that, Zenobia. We rely on these people's charity, even if they are heretics. We've got no money left, retorted Irina. Heathen would be more accurate, thought Kaneko. She left the lack of theological education be, though. The two exorcists continued their conversation. Zenovia glowered at Irina and said. That's because you blew all our money on that fake painting. The thing she pointed at looked horrendous. It had to be some sort of caricature, or it was a really amateurish attempt. No, that is definitely a saint. The person at the exhibition said so, protested Irina. Do you have any idea who this is supposed to be? I certainly don't, countered Zenovia. Uh, Saint Peter. Zenovia once again pointed at the ill-made painting that depicted a badly drawn man with something on his head and a baby angel in the background. Saint Peter wouldn't look like this at all. She said. No, that's what he must have looked like. Argued Irina. Zenovia let out a sigh. 
Is this some sort of trial set by God? Why do I have to have an airhead like you as my partner? Hey, don't get depressed now. It doesn't suit you, said Irina. Zenobia angrily replied. Shut up, you heretic. You Protestants should have more respect for the saints. Respect. You Catholics and your dusty old rules don't know anything about respect, shot back Arena. Heretic. Heretic. Their argument stopped when their stomachs grumbled simultaneously. The fight left them visibly, and their budding heads separated from each other. We should focus on the food situation. Our mission won't fulfill itself if we starve, said Zenobia. We could threaten the heretics for some money. I don't like it, but God will forgive our sin if it's for the mission, suggested Arena. Desecrating shrines and stealing the ephedrine boxes won't be a good idea. We could try a street performance with our blades. That works everywhere, countered Zenobia. Except that it did not in Japan. Weapons were illegal to carry in Japan. Kaneko's opinion of the two lowered itself again. Arena loved the idea, however. Yes. We can cut fruit with the Excaliburs. We could make some good money that way. We don't have any fruit, though. Well, no other choice then. Let's cut up that painting, said Zenobia. No. Kaneko glanced at her companions, and she saw that they were stuck between bewilderment and annoyance. She saw Issei sigh before he stepped forward to approach them. Hey, you two. We're about to eat. Do you want to come with us? Ahahaha. Yes. Two more disciples. Soon, the whole world shall bow before the glory that is Raman. The insane ramblings of her teacher aside, Kaneko was amazed by the speed at which the exorcist girls devoured their food. She looked at Naruto and asked him dryly. Aren't you worried they'll eat the whole stock? I know we gave you coupons, but this is getting expensive. Nonsense. Retorted the man while wagging a finger at the air. Bringing the glory and deliciousness of ramen to the people of the world is a mission worth any cost. She stared at him. Plus, I'm loaded, he added with a grin. How? She asked. He snorted and said. I'm a shinobi. Figure it out. But let's leave that for now. Why are you guys here? We need to discuss important business in private, answered Kaneko. There was a gleam in his eyes as he grinned and said. Then you came to the right place. Once the two little ladies have finished their meal, I'll take you to the training ground. How much are they going to fit in their stomachs? Asked Issei in wonderment. Naruto hummed for a short moment and answered. I'd say one more bowl each. They don't look starved, just famished. And what if they were starved? Asked the boy. The blonde man's humor evaporated. Then they'd be as good as dead by this point, kid. Only light food for people recovering from starvation. If you feed them more, their bodies can't handle it, and they die. I've seen it happen too many times to forget that. While the devils stood over that fact, the exorcists finished their meal. Content size left them. That was delicious. Japanese food is really good, said Zenobia. It's the taste of my homeland. I'd forgotten what it was like, commented Arinsa. Naruto laughed and said. There's nothing better in the world than a good bowl of ramen. It's just a shame that we have to depend on the charity of devils, lamented Arena. Zenobia added dramatically. We've sold our souls. Naruto snorted and said. It's my charity too. Those were my coupons that provided for part of your meals. Now let's deal with business. Follow me. The group left the front of the shop to enter the storage area. There, they went to the summoning circle on the floor. Kaneko was already used to it and did it without a fuss. The others followed her example. A second later, they were already at the training ground. This place is beautiful, said Issei. Thanks. I took a long while to get it like this, responded Naruto. The others except for his student looked around as well, drinking in the details of the place. The church girls were quick to gather their wits again, however. What do you want to talk about? Asked Zenobia. Issei scratched his cheek awkwardly and said. You came here to retrieve or destroy the Excaliburs, right? That is correct. If we can't take them back, we're supposed to destroy them, said Zenobia. So, the minimum objective is their destruction. Good. In that case, we want to help you destroy the Excaliburs, announced the boy. Zenobia hummed before she said. Well, that is okay. You need to make sure you stay anonymous, though. If the higher-ups find out that we took help from the devils, we're done for. We can leave one of the swords for you to destroy if you can do that. Hey, is that really okay, Zenobia? Even if it's a say, we can't really accept the aid of the devil, said Irina. Zenobia shook her head and said. It would be really tough to fulfill our mission with just the two of us. But. She ignored Arena's protests and went on. Our minimal objective is the destruction of the Excaliburs. But even if we went all out, we would likely have to destroy our own swords. Our chance of success lies at 30% at best. What idiot came up with that figure? Asked Naruto. Everyone looked at him strangely. Arena said. That was the intelligence division of the Vatican. Zenobia nodded in confirmation. 
Then they're either incompetent or full of traitors, said Naruto. I've heard Kakabiel has five pairs of wings, and on my travels, I've met an angel with the same number. If their power compares even remotely, your chances of success lie somewhere around 10%. If you want to make it out alive, make that 5%. Traitors, muttered Irina. Naruto nodded. I've had my suspicions about this ever since Kaneko told me about it. I've contacted a few people and I should get an answer soon. For now, it'd be a good idea for you guys to team up. Zenovia shrugged. My beliefs are flexible, so I can be pragmatic. Your faith is weird, said Irina. Dying for the cause is something a follower of God should desire, no. To come back home healthy and whole, and continue to fight for God sounds better to me, countered Zenovia. Irina thought it over. You're not exactly wrong, she said. Plus, we can say we're borrowing the power of a dragon. The request came from a childhood friend of yours, right? Let's trust in the power of a dragon, then, proposed Zenovia. They didn't forbid us to ask the aid of a dragon, but that's just skirting the rules. I'll say it again. Your faith is weird, Zenovia. Declared Arena. Why? Asked Issei. I've asked Drag about the Great War a bit, and he said that there were some dragons who fought on your side. Zenovia pointed at him and looked at Arena while saying. See? We have nothing to worry about. Arena's face took on a complicated expression. Then, she sighed. Fine, but only because it's Issei. Great. We have an agreement, then. I'll call my partner for this fight, said Issei. He then took out his phone and put in Kiba's number. Then, he paused. Do we even have reception here? He asked Naruto. We do. I set up a relay when I made this place. It's an isolated space, but thanks to that, we have a connection, answered the older man. Issei nodded, called the number, and then spoke. Kiba, I've got the Excalibur wielders here. We had a talk. You should come here so we can hush out the details. I'll be there. Naruto was listening in on them. He said. Well you guys wait for him to get to my shop, you're free to spar and use the training ground as you see fit. Kaneko, come with me, please. He grabbed his student and led her away while the four others stayed behind. He took her behind the tree line and sat down. He motioned for her to do the same. When she had lowered herself to the ground, she asked. What is it, sensei? I wanted to tell you that you pass, he told her. She blinked at him. Huh? You've passed the initiation test. You see, back home, graduating students from the academy have to pass a test for their sensei to accept them as Genin students. The nature of the test is up to the Jonin teacher in question. I'm from a line of teachers who use the bell test. That's only something that can be done with three students, though. So, I had to devise a new test for you that tests the same qualities, explained Naruto. An echo furrowed her brows. But, I have no idea what you tested. He smiled brightly at her and said. Teamwork. You're breaking the rules for the sake of a teammate. That is a boy you brought along as well. The risk you're taking is immense. But it was his idea. I'm just going along with it, remarked Kaneko. So what? You're still doing it of your own free will. The consequences are gonna be severe in any case, aren't they? She nodded slowly. No matter if it was on Issei's initiative, she was essential going AWOL. In some devil households, that was a death sentence. She doubted it would be that bad for her, but she dreaded her punishment. Yes, she said. And that's why you pass, said Naruto. When I passed the bell test, my sensei told me something I've taken to heart. You should do so as well. It goes like this. Those who disobey the rules are trash. Those who abandon their comrades are worse than trash. I've lived by those words for all my life ever since. Today, you've shown me that you understand them as well. He then pulled something out of a bell pouch and presented it to her. It was a headband with a metal plate at its center. On the plate sat a swirl within a circle. She examined it and looked up at him. What is that? He smiled at her and said. I can't make you a shinobi of Konoha, my home. But I can make you a shinobi of my clan. I'm the clan head, after all, and you've proven your worth to me. If you accept this headband, you'll be an honorary member of the Uzumaki clan. When you have nowhere left to go, when you are lost, whenever you need help, the clan will always be a home to you. Every Uzumaki will recognize you as family. She looked at him with wide eyes and an open mouth. That was an offer she had not expected, and it overwhelmed her. She, who had never known her parents and had lost her sister, craved family. That was why she was helping Yudo achieve his revenge. The Gremory Peerage was family, and Yudo was a part of it. And now, she was receiving an offer of kinship once more. But I'm part of the President's Peerage. I can't join your clan. I'm part of the Gremory family, she said. He laughed and told her. Having family doesn't mean you can't get more. It doesn't matter if you're a Taoju, a Gremory or a nameless cur from the arse end of nowhere. Whatever else you are, you're an Uzumaki too, believe it. And even if we're not close yet, that can change. 
besides, the promise of support and asylum extends to your family too. I don't have to give up anything. She asked. He shook his head and smiled. No, nothing at all. There are no obligations to the clan at all. Hineko finally grasped the headband and said. I accept, then. In that case, I welcome you as the newest daughter of the clan, said Naruto with a warm smile. She blushed at his words. Daughter. No one had ever called her that. It felt nice, she decided. There was a warm, fuzzy feeling to it. She had a question, however. Why did you make that offer? We haven't known each other for long, she asked. He told her. Because it seems to me like you're a girl who's afraid to be alone. I wanted to show you that you won't ever have to be. And remember that I've felt you speared. Who would not want a bright girl like you in their family? I also chose to do this because the will of fire is in my soul. I've mentioned it before, haven't I? When she nodded, he continued. The will of fire is the belief that the next generation must be nurtured so it can surpass the old one, rekindling the old flame again and again. In less stuffy words, old folks like me gotta look out for young kids like you. If you could use more family, that's what I'm gonna give you. Hineko stared at him in wonderment for a bit longer. Then, she slowly smiled. That fit her teacher perfectly. Can we practice ninju while we wait for you Udo? She asked. Naruto's smile turned into a grin, and he said. Of course. Let's do that. Naruto had known the girl for so little time, yet he knew that he had found himself in her. His younger self had been very similar to Kaneko. The desire for family, for acceptance and recognition, that was very familiar to him. She was a kindred spirit. Just like he had struggled to accept his nature as a Jinchuriki, she was struggling to accept her nature as a Nekashu. To be fair, his struggle had been incredibly short-lived thanks to Aruka, but there was no Aruka in Kaneko's life. Nobody, not even her beloved president, had told her that it was okay to be a Nekashu. He did not blame the Redeed for this oversight, seeing as teens were not qualified to be therapists, but the problem persisted. Kaneko needed someone who accepted her not only for who she was, but also for what she was. Evil society as a whole feared and despised Nekashu thanks to her sister's crimes. They painted Kaneko with the same brush. The unwillingness to accept her had been palpable early on, from what he had been able to gather. Even though the hostility had lessened in recent years, its impact remained. Kaneko's rejection of her own nature had been the result. Naruto now considered it his mission to get her to accept herself. Chakra and Senjutsu practice were a good start. They were part of her very being, her heritage. If he could get her to accept one, she would accept the other. He would not rest until the day she could feel comfortable in her own skin. And, if he was not mistaken, that Issei boy would help him in that endeavor. Everything about him reminded him of his godfather Jiraiya, he had the same aura of a super pervert, but he also had the same fiery compassionate soul. Naruto could not be sure just yet, but he had a feeling that Issei would play a pivotal role in Kaneko's life. Time would tell if he was right. Due to the distance involved, it took Yudo some time to reach the ramen shop. From there on, however, it took less than a minute to get him to the training ground, where the others were already waiting. When he arrived, he blinked. How did you get here so fast? He asked Naruto. I've been here since before your friend called you, answered the man. The slightly twitching of his lips told Kaneko that he knew something Yudo did not. She was curious as well, and decided to pay a bit more attention. But you just sent me here, said Yudo. No, that was me, said Naruto's voice. It did not come from where she could see him, though. Instead, it came from the tree line. From behind one of the trees emerged another man. He looked exactly like Naruto, down to the tiniest detail. Did he have a twin brother? What the fuck? Shouted Saji. There's two of you. Two. Three, said another man using Naruto's voice and appearance. He had emerged from the woods. Four. Five. Six. There's as many of me as I need, finished the original Naruto. The others stared wide-eyed at him. Those are some really convincing illusions, said Zenobia. Naruto grinned. Are they? He asked. Three of the copies stepped forward and poked her forehead simultaneously. Then, all of them went up in smoke. Illusions are for pansies with no substance, he said. Real professionals use classic types of deceptions. How are you doing that? Asked Kaneko. He answered. You're going to learn over the next few days. Interesting, she said, but I meant how you're deceiving us. He grinned at her. Well spotted. You'll make a fine shinobi, Genin Kaneko. She blushed at the praise, but doubled up. And the deception. He raised an eyebrow and asked back. Weren't you trying to talk about Excalibur? That brought everyone's thoughts to a halt. That had indeed been the purpose of their gathering here. The man was good at being a distraction. If that's all, I'll sit back while you discuss your thing. Just don't get sidetracked, he teased. Not cool, complained to say. An echo suppressed a snort. She did not entirely succeed. The noise put the boy back on topic. 
right, he said, see, Kiba, we negotiated with the Excalibur wielders. The plan is to team up and help them. If we do that, we can destroy one of the Excaliburs. Can I get a bit more detail on that? Asked Yudo. The gist of the negotiations was then relayed to him. From the minimally required goal to the reasoning behind the cooperation, everything was summed up in short. By the end of it, Yudo seemed on board with the idea. It leaves a bit of a bad taste to have permission, though, he said. I guess there's nothing for it. It's better than nothing. Still, it's somewhat unsatisfying. We're all making compromises here. If you were a stray devil, I'd cut you down on the spot, said Zenobia. Irina saw the mounting hostility and sought to deflect it, saying. So, you have a grudge against the Holy Sword project. It's hard not to, he said flatly and with anger. But thanks to it, there are now many more Holy Sword wielders than there were before, including me, protested Irina. Kaneko winced. That was not the thing to say. It was insensitive, though going by the other girl's expression, it was probably not meant as an insult. That did not stop Yudo from taking it as one, however. He asked heatedly. And that justifies the murder of all test subjects, simply because they failed to provide the desired results. Irina did not know how to answer. Fortunately for her, Zenobia did. That is a mark of shame for the church. It was against our policy, and the man in charge was investigated. His faith was found wanting. He was charged with heresy. As far as we know, he defected to the Grigori. I want to know his name, said Kiba. Alper Galilei, responded Zenobia. He received the moniker Genocide Archbishop for his misdeeds. Udo looked thoughtful. He muttered. If he's with a Grigori, then I can get to him by fighting the Fallen. All right. His voice got a bit louder as he said. In that case, there's something I should tell you. Some time ago, I came across a priest who was attacked and killed. If his robes were any indication, he was one of yours. The killer's name is Fried Selzen. Do you know him? Ah, it's him, said Zenobia. Irina added. He was hailed a prodigy of the Vatican. He became an exorcist at 13 and had many accomplishments under his belt. His faith was lacking even back then, though. He went crazy early on. All he really cares about is battle and killing. He even killed his allies. He was charged with heresy, but he escaped before he could be brought to justice, elaborated Zenobia. I see. So you hold a grudge against him as well. Very well, I'll cooperate, said Udo. Hineko also had a score to settle with the insane priest. He had murdered clients of hers and attacked her. She was more than happy to help bring him down. Zenovia nodded and the jotted down something on a notepad. Let's coordinate, then. Call this number if something is up. Issei then said. Let me give you my number as well. Oh, Auntie Hiyadu already gave us your number, said Irina cheerfully. He looked at her in dismay. Seriously? Mom, how could you give away my number without permission, he cried out. There were snickers to be heard as he said that. The amusement was cut short, however. Zenovia said. That's everything. I'm ready to leave. Thanks for the meal. Thanks for the meal, Issei, said Irina to the boy whose funds had borne the brunt of her and Zenobia's hunger. Treat me again sometime, right? You may be a devil, but you're Issei, so God will allow it. There's always an exception for food. She winked at him as she said that. Hineko stared flatly at her, taking in Issei's look of disbelief as well. That girl's faith was as weird as her companion's. That, and the winking was strange. Did she have a crush on the pervert or something? The Nekashu shook her head. The two exorcists were then led away by Naruto. When they were gone, Yudo looked at Issei and asked. Why did you do this? Because you're a comrade, answered Issei. You're a fellow member of the Gremory group and you've helped me before. I thought I should help you out in return. Yudo raised an eyebrow. Is that so? If I go off by myself, I'll cause trouble for the president, so that's part of the reason too, no. Well, yeah. She'd go crazy. Honestly, I'm in deep shit too, for setting up this meeting and making that plan. I'm making plenty of trouble for her, but it's miles better than you going stray. Replied the other boy. Udo still looked unsure. It was time to do something, Kaneko decided. She was not one for wearing her heart on her sleeve, but this was too important to not express herself. Don't leave, please, she said as she approached him. She fraught back tears as she gripped his clothes and continued. I'll get lonely if you leave. I'll help you, but please, stay with us. As much as she appreciated Naruto's offer of kinship from before, she had a family she felt closer to. The Gremory peerage was just that. Ria's and Akeno were her older sisters, and Yudo was like a brother to her. Gaspar, Ashia and even Issei were dear to her too. Losing any of them was not an option. Yudo sighed. I surrender. It's impossible to say no to you, Kaneko. And thank you as well, Issei. I now know who my true enemy is and who my allies are. Let's do this together. Kaneko noted the happy expressions around her and smiled slightly as well. Issei then said. 
Hell yes. Let's destroy Excalibur and that shitty priest freed. Do I have to as well? Asked Saji awkwardly with a raised hand. It's not like I'm involved in this. I also don't get how Kiba and Excalibur are related. That sounds like some heavy talk, said Naruto, inserting himself into the conversation. Take these. He handed everyone still present a can of tea. It's from a vending machine, so it's not top notch, but the brand is good. Helps calm tempers, he said. Thank you, said Kiba. He opened the can and took a sip from the tea before he began his tale. I was raised in a church facility. It was filled with orphans like me, test subjects for the Holy Sword Project. Our entirely lives were dedicated to serving God in the church. However, when the project failed to yield results, the facility was shut down, and the experiments liquidated. The ones in charge of the facility killed everyone. They said prayers as they killed us with poison gas. We prayed to God for salvation, but no help came. Only I escaped. He went into a bit more detail about his escape and what had happened after that, how he had been found by Rias when he had been on death's door due to the poison gas, and how she had rescued him. And that's why I'm doing this. I have to settle my comrades' regrets. I must live in their place and destroy Excalibur in their stead. Everyone was deeply moved by the story. Kaneko had known it before, and so had Issei and Naruto to some extent, but Saji was new to this information. The boy was even sobbing a little, and there were tears in his eyes. That must have been painful. I understand now, he said. Your passion for the destruction of Excalibur and your grudge against the church. I used to dislike you for being a pretty boy. Kaneko resisted the urge to sigh. Another one, she thought. But you're a good guy. Damn it, I'll help. I'm willing to risk punishment from the student council president for this. I'm on your side for this operation. So, don't go dying on us. You've got to live on for your comrades and the president who saved your life. Saji was remarkably similar to Issei in many regards, Kaneko noted. Both boys were easily moved by things like this. It made it easy to be friends with them, despite their flaws. In light of this and our cooperation, I will tell you about my ambition a well. Began Saji. He took a deep breath before he continued. My dream is to impregnate and marry the student council president. It's going to be a hard task for an unpopular guy like me to impregnate any girl, but I will definitely knock up President Sona Sitri. Listen up Saji. My dream is to grope my president's boobs and then suck on them. Declared to say. Oh no. They really are the same, thought Kaneko in dismay. And here she had complimented them. How disappointing. Do you know how hard it is to touch a high-class devil's boobs, man? Asked Saji. Issei chuckled. You fool. I've already done that. That's why I must go beyond and suck on them. If I can do it, then so can you. Saji looked at him with wide eyes. Are you for real? That's possible. It will be hard, but it's possible, declared Issei. But, sucking them, on the nipples, right? Said Saji lost in thought. Of course, you dingus. That's the only real place where you can suck on boobs, responded the other boy. The manly tears that fell from Saji's eyes heralded the coming of a massive headache for Kaneko. Just why did those two have to be like that? Sadly for her mental state, Issei was not quite finished yet. We may be lost on our own, but together, we can achieve anything. By working together, we can achieve our goals. We can impregnate and marry our masters. The war cries they issued were entirely unfitting for the serious topic of the previous conversation. They were good at lightening the mood though. The haha, laughed Yudo as she observed the two idiots. You're the worst, said Kaneko with her usual stoic expression. As for Naruto. Wahahahaha. <laughs> oh man, I haven't seen stuff like that in ages. Those guys are comedy gold. Kaneko, keep them around. I haven't laughed like that in years. She sighed. She could not speak for Saji, but she would keep around to say. He was a nuisance at times, and he was annoying pervert most of the time, but there was no doubt that he was reliable in a pinch. I will, sensei, she told Naruto. Great, he said. Now listen up, boys. That drew their attention. Since you use my shop and my training ground for your little get-together, I'm gonna ask you for a bit of payment, he said. Wait, what? exclaimed Issei. I'm out of cash. You can't do this. Naruto waved his hand and said. Don't worry, I'm not asking for money. I'm far more interested in the sacred gears you guys have, especially the ones on Saji and Hiyadu. Are you mad that'll kill us? shouted Saji. Not like that, you idiot, said the blonde man while rolling his eyes. I'm a seal master, and sacred gears have some of the most interesting seals I've ever seen. This biblical god is an absolute genius, so I take every opportunity I can get to examine them. Issei and Saji calmed down after hearing those words. I see, said Issei. It's okay in that case. Naruto smiled and said. That's good. I let you use my training ground in exchange. I'll even spar with you guys and help you polish your techniques while I'm at it. 
I can't let my students' teammates fall behind, after all. Hineko poked him in the side and asked. Is that a good idea? It is, he said. I can train you all at the same time thanks to my shadow clones. And it's always good for you to have support. You're my precious student, after all. It'll be good for you to bond over training too. Never forget the importance of bonds. I've missed you, said a voice he instantly recognized. She was the dearest person to his heart. Over the eons he had lived, she had always been his greatest treasure and the source of his strength. And although she was dead, she remained deeply rooted in his heart. She was Hinata, the love of his life, and his wife. Not as much as I've missed you, said Naruto. She looked at him with sad eyes and replied. I love you for wanting to visit me more often, but you know why I don't want you to. It breaks my heart to be away from you, he told her. He gently cupped her cheeks and kissed her on the lips. It was a sort of ritualistic greeting by this point. He did it every time he came to visit his wife in the pure world. Despite that, it had never lost its beauty, its emotional weight, or its exhilarating feeling. She reciprocated his gesture in kind. Contrary to how she acted as a child and young adult, Hinata had always been a ferocious lover. She had still been as deferential as one would have expected from her behavior around him, but there had always been great energy and vigor in her. Accordingly, her kiss left her husband breathless. Once their lips parted again, she said. I know, dear. I know how painful this is for you. That doesn't change my opinion, however. You need to find someone in the world of the living who can give you the stability you seek from me. She had begun saying things like that centuries ago. His longing for her left her pain for some reason. She had thus begun encouraging him to find a new love. Unfortunately for her, Naruto found that notion ridiculous. He looked affronted. Hinata, how can you say that? I'd never cheat on you. Not in a million years. Not in a billion. She brushed a hand over his cheek and responded. Who said anything about cheating? If I'm okay with it, it doesn't count, does it? Our vows were to the death, Naruto. I'm dead, so I won't be mad if you find another woman you can love. I can't just let go of you. You're my everything, he protested. You misunderstand. It's not about letting go, it's about letting someone else in, she countered. Naruto shook his head and said. Nobody is as perfect as you. Besides, it wouldn't be fair to her. I won't ever abandon you. Haven't you visited many worlds where it's normal to have multiple partners? Continuing to love me while you love another woman is not a problem as far as I can tell, argued the pale eyes woman. He sighed. I just don't think it'll happen, he said. Not with that attitude, she snarked. But please consider it at least. I hate to see you so lost every time you come to me. You need someone to keep you anchored to the living. I have my apprentices and students, retorted Naruto. Who are all adult and independent by now, said Hanada. He shook his head and said. No. I have a new student. It's been about two weeks since we met. She's 16. Hanada sighed. She knew she would get no further with the previous topic, and so she decided to instead talk about what he had brought up. Tell me a bit about her, she said. Naruto smiled and recounted his encounters with the young Nekashu. He explained the background of her species, the history he had managed to unearth, the state of chakra and senjutsu in her world, and he regaled his wife with the tale of what had happened the previous day. You offered her membership in the clan awfully fast, remarked Hinata. I did, admitted Naruto, but Kaneko is deathly afraid of loneliness and abandonment. I wanted to offer her some security, and I want to bond with her. It's gonna be tough, though. She's very closed off, even with Ninshu. What about that boy you told me about? Asked Hinata. The pervert. It's like seeing pervy sage again. He's dense but reliable. Kaneko's spirit is drawn to him, for sure. The type of support he would give he is way different, though, he argued. Hmm, how so? Asked Hinata. Naruto raised an eyebrow and asked back. Did you discuss the same things with me that you discussed with Uncle Hiyashi? Or with Hanabi? Not every bond is the same, even if they're equally strong. Fair point, conceded his wife. Well, if you wish to adopt little Kaneko into our clan, you have my approval. Be aware of your commitment to her, though. Always, he said with conviction. Hanada smiled at him and kissed him again. She said. Good. Since you can't put children into me anymore, that's the only way for me to get any. You'd better watch out for our newest daughter, alright. She won't view me as family for some time yet, but I'll be damned if I don't take care of her, he told her. That earned him yet another kiss from his wife. She loved his parental side. Even back when she had been alive, he had often adopted students of his, sometimes very quickly after meeting them. Their children by blood had grown up with many adopted siblings as a result. Even after she had been long past her childbearing age, he had continued to bring in children. That tradition had continued from there on, and it was ongoing still. That compassionate side of his was one of the many things she loved about him. When she drew back again, she sent a smile at her husband and said. 
If that's the case, I won't worry about her. He gave her a thumbs up and a grin. Believe it. Her gaze then became half-lidded as she said. Right now, you have someone else to take care of, though, don't you? She unwrapped the robe she was wearing, letting it drop on the floor and exposing her naked body to Naruto. She licked her lips when she saw his eyes drift lower. I do, huh? He said. Then, he moved toward her and kissed her again. His hands roamed her body, and her hands roamed his, and soon they were too busy to care about anything else. Students, swords, and worldly troubles could wait. For now, they had each other, and that was all that mattered. Thank you for watching. I hope you all enjoyed the story. If you did, please like the video. Also consider subscribing and sharing this with your friends. This will really mean a lot for me. I'll see you in the next one.